Chile do the same and win their first Copa America. What a man to win it. And Chile is champion. Welcome to the Chilean Football Show on the Red One TV. Thanks for joining us. This is episode two now of the Chilean Football Show on the Red One TV. I'm your host and moderator, Tom Sneff. This is a one-hour show dedicated to Chilean football in English, where we'll cover La Roja, Primera División, Chileans abroad, and everything in between. I would like to announce a partnership with uh, Chile Today News, who is the only multimedia news platform in Chile that covers news in English. Our good friend, Boris van der Speck, is the owner. Uh, before I go around and say hi to the team, I want you to introduce the newest member uh, of our panel, Daniel Campos. Daniel, how are you? Hi, how are you? Thanks for, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure and I think, um, yeah, there's plenty to to um, delve into. Mm -hmm. Definitely, you know, with, with all, everything that you've mentioned, uh, you know, with Chilean football. So thank you. Thank you for Perfect. having me. Perfect. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself since uh, in the inaugural episode, we, uh, we all introduced our, uh, ourselves and what we're doing uh, uh, currently. Yeah, just quickly. Um, I'm of Chilean parents um, from Sydney, Australia. Um, so that makes me an Australian, another country where the round ball, the beautiful game is not, is not, um, not number one, doesn't capture everyone's uh, hearts and minds, but um, it's definitely a game that, that has grown over the years. Um, so, yeah, I've had a I've had an upbringing where you know my football's not oval shaped; it's it's round, and um, that's that's a story in itself. Um, you gotta you gotta fight a lot against the current there, um, but definitely something that forms a part of your identity. Um, yeah, I did have a brief um, spell in the game professionally um, as a goalkeeper. Um, in Australia, here in Chile, and um, yeah, in, in a few of the lower leagues as well in, in, in Europe. But um, I, uh, yeah, that was a cut short. And um, I've spent the last, ooh, if I do my maths, probably 12 or 13 years in coaching. Um, I'm a goalkeeper coach myself. And, um, and also, yeah, been a a writer, analyst, pundit. So it's definitely the these kind of uh, you know um, panels and, and talk shows are definitely uh, something um, up my alley. So again, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, like you said, there's plenty to to uh, to talk about. Well, we uh, we appreciate you uh, being here. Uh, uh, Martin uh, joined us for the first episode, but now he has since left for uh, personal reasons. Uh, Anyhow, uh, Matias, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, still tr struggling to come to terms with the, the two results, but struggling on. How are you? Dude, you're doing well. Alex, how is uh, everything also in England? Um, I think I'm probably doing a bit better than Matias at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Nicolas, what's, uh, what's happening in Chile? Well, how are you doing, guys? Uh, nice to see you again. Uh, well, here we are, uh, the day after, um, we're still looking back, we're still trying to read what happened in the matches to to get an explanation. Um, well, at least mine uh, are more positive than negative, so we're, we will be talking about that, as you said, and well, uh, um, I'm very happy to, to have our second episode to tell the people about the Chilean football, so here we go. Here we go, is indeed. And uh, in case you don't know, uh, Chile played uh, two qualifying matches in the first two fixtures of combo World qualifying. Uh, first game, uh, Chile lost. Uh, you know, a very controversial VAR decision. Um, you know, what led to, to the event, uh, explanation being that um, the hand uh, was in a natural position. Um, first, I want to get, uh, before, before we dive into VAR, just to give fans a little preview we'll talk about VR, VR later but first I just, I just want to get your your first uh, impressions of uh, of the first 20 minutes uh, of how uh, uh, Chile kicked off against a very very powerful Uruguayan side uh, Matias why don't you uh, kick us off um, I must say uh, I was actually quite pleasantly surprised with how they played in that Uruguay game 
Um, I mean, I think unlike a couple of the guys on this podcast, um, maybe it was the, the natural pessimist in me. I wasn't really expecting much from, from the team. But I mean, I mean, I think you could argue that that game against Uruguay, um, despite the end result, was perhaps one of the best games for me anyway that the team has, has played under Reynaldo Rueda. They looked solid. I really liked the makeshift defence. Um, and I think overall, there was a lot of there were a lot of positives to take from that game. Um, and then, obviously, you have you have the end result, which I, I don't think reflects um, how well the team performed in that match. Nicolas, how did you see it? Well, um, besides uh, what it is just Uruguay, uh, I see the whole thing in a positive way. I mean, um, we have to think that the, the manager had 10 players uh, that weren't uh, called because of the injuries or because of the COVID. So those were uh, things that obviously in the paper before the match, you, you, turn, you, you, you see it and, and, and you, ask, you ask yourself uh, how to how to step uh, over it. And so I think that Rueda made a good job. I think Rueda find uh, uh, good names that there were not in the radar before. Um, they were not in the map before as Ralta was, uh, we can say he was, uh, he was playing against uh, good strikers, not uh, any striker. We are talking about Duan Zapata and Luis Suarez. He made a great job uh, besides that. Uh, that header that goes uh, off from the area and, well, the, the rebound is taken by the Uruguayan play and then comes the goal. But it, 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 that's not Serrata's fault. It, it was because there was to be, there was supposed to be a, a, a midfielder stepping on that uh, area in the field. But that's another, that's another word. Um, I'm happy with what Chile showed, uh, including what I just said. Um, they had the players that couldn't play we're talking about Bravo Medel, Pulgar, Orellana. We're talking about this, like the first match. Um, well, the, I don't remember now uh, who, who else, but uh, I am happy with that. I am happy with the defensive line. I think we found four or five more names that we didn't have. We have uh, very well covered the centre-back position in this moment. We just have to make them play, and with the matches, they're going to they're gonna get the the experience they need and, and that's good for the team and that's good for, for them too. So I'm happy with that. You know, a very, very interesting uh, back four, completely new uh, with uh, Nicolas Diaz, um, uh, Paulo Diaz, his brother, um, like you, you mentioned, uh, Sierra Alta uh, and Sebastian Vegas. Um, uh, Alex, uh, did this back four uh, surprise you? Um, I think for me, I'm quite different than the other two at the moment. Um, I'm not quite happy with the defensive line. <laughs> um, if you look at the goals, I think that was, it was just, we were ball watching. I mean, there was no, if you look at, they were trying to press together and they were trying to be compact in the middle, but that just resulted in at least one defender just ball watching. Um, if you see, yeah, that, I mean, the Uruguay penalty came from a, terrible pass in the midfield and that happened to go there and the reason why the handball well the controversial handball happened was because he was trying to catch up with the player that was running because he was ball watching and he, he had no reason to be next to the center back which he was and then he had to run over and, and catch up the space that he left behind so I'm not I'm not too happy with the defensive line and um, that it's not because of the new players that are on there. I think it was just more a tactical decision that kind of Uruguay just broke us down and we were caught ball watching. Um, so I think I'm a bit more pessimistic um, compared to the other two guys. Daniel, what, what about you? Um, were, were you, uh, did you expect this kind of uh, performance? I, um, I'll have to replicate Alex's, um, you know, intake. Uh, why? Because again, um, completely agree. There was ball watching. There were instances. Well, generally, the zonal marking was. Um, I mean, we need to, you know, remember that that a football match is, you know, beyond ninety minutes. There are instances of, of intensity. The game slows down. Now with VAR, you know, the game is, is is almost like a rugby league or rugby union match where, 
you know, a basketball match, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a, a timeout. And it, that freezes the when you're on when you're in the on the on the field of play, you, you're in the intensity of the match. You know, you're in the adrenaline, and that that freezes it. It, it cools down, and you got to get back into the match. And I think those patches um, are where you know this defense, as much as it's been positive individually, um, generally speaking, collectively, the backline needs to apply itself. And that's, um, you know, in the final moments. And we saw that both against Uruguay and Colombia. But um, you're only going to get, you're only going to polish that with, with mileage on the clock. You've got you to add the kilometres. And that's, unfortunately, um, you know, it's ideal to clock that up in friendly matches. But given the whole situation of COVID and, and, and the FIFA calendar, um, Rueda is, is sort of, obliged to do that with with um with proper you know qualifying matches where there's so much at stake points and that's that's the main thing we need points we can play pretty football but we ultimately we need the points um so yeah i i agree with alex um even though individually serrata i mean it's probably the you know the most positive of of, of all the players and and um and uh, Pablo Diaz. But uh, Sebastián Vegas is not a left back, and that was proven um, with the second match um, at the Nacional. Even though he's not a left back, he's a centre back. Um, I think he's he's done really well to play out of position. Um, but yes, like Alex said, um, he was left exposed, particularly in the first, um, you know, penalty scored by converted by Luis Suarez. So there's there's those kind of you know details that need um, adjustments. Yeah. I would like to aggregate there that, uh, well, I agree with, with both of you. Uh, the, de the defensive uh, backline was better in individual terms than the whole collective uh, situation. But um, I stay with the names. As you said, um, Daniel, uh, Sierra Alta could probably be the, the best uh, center back or, or the best de discovering from Reda this, this day. And that's what gives me hope uh, because we had to, uh, I, I'm sorry to repeat it once and once again, but we had 10 players uh, that weren't called because of the, of the issues and due to the coronavirus and due to the injuries and, and all of that. But um, taking that, that this was the first date uh, playing against two uh, direct uh, enemies as Uruguay and Colombia are to go to, the, to Qatar, Uh, I think they did well. Uh, I think uh, we, everyone, uh, including us, maybe, uh, we expected uh, much less from this team. And they came with a result that is a two against one in Uruguay that could have been perfectly been uh, two to one or, or a one on one but, uh, for, for that robbery that we saw from the Conmebol referee. And well, that's another chapter to, to write. So I wanted to talk about football. Uh, that's what gives me hope that this team uh, added to the to the the real starters as as they are Medel, as the series Bravo, Pulgar for me the most important in the middle because Baeza, if if well if he he wasn't so bad but he he wasn't especially a good player. So I think uh, this team combined with our classic team may may be a team that could probably compete. To go to Qatar, maybe for the fourth or the five or the fifth key, key, case there to go to to, to the World mm. Cup, and and also to add what um, Nicolas is saying, um, I mean we've got Matias and Alex who are in the UK, so please, um, you know, <laughs> keep track of uh, Serralta now that he's at, he's at Watford. Um, I think Rueda uh, hit the bullseye with Serralta because Uruguay is that physical kind of uh, opposition, and so. Yeah, as much as he's still going to need some time to, to readjust to the championship, which is very much underrated. It's a very physical, competitive league. It's probably, well, it's definitely the best second tier league in the world, and it's up there in the top five in the world. Um, it's a very demanding and long season, and um, and obviously it's a change from from Italian culture. So he's done very well, and you know he, he fitted very well against the physicality demanded. Um, against Uruguay and then last night against Colombia. So, um, yeah, <laughs> please keep track of them, um, you know, because he's, he's now in the UK. <laughs> um, guys, you know, 
not, uh, Claudio Bravo not being there, a uh, big loss. Uh, one of the 10 players that, that Nicolás has, has mentioned. Um, Arias going in the first game against Uruguay. Uh, and Brian Cortez in the second game. Uh, you know, uh, Nicolás mentioned that in the last episode, uh, uh, very surprised call up, you're not even uh, starting goalkeeper at Colo Colo. Uh, different story for Brian Cortez, but uh, a lot of people had uh, had doubts on him. Uh, Matias, what do you think of the, the goalkeeping overall? I mean, again, um, actually pleasantly surprised with what I saw from from both of them. Um, I think a couple of the guys last week were, or a couple of weeks ago were really sort of bigging up uh, Arias in goal. I had huge doubts about him. I'd, I'd never been convinced by by what I'd seen, especially in, in the national team. But I think he performed really well. He was really solid in the first game against Uruguay. Um, and similarly with Cortes in the second game, I... When I saw he, when I saw Adias was injured and I saw his name on the team sheet, I feared the worst from from the start. Um, but I have to say, again, very very pleasantly surprised with with uh, his performance. Alex, what did you think? Um, I think I'm the same. I think I was more impressed with Brian Cortez. Um, I think he did brilliantly against Colombia. Um, it was it wasn't even just that much it was just simple goalkeeping that you don't I guess not that you don't see it quite often but it was he went off in the corners he wasn't afraid to punch in the area I mean it was um what was it Arturo Vidal he almost got a non goal I mean Cortez's reaction was very quick I mean it it was quite simple but I think he was on his game um quite quite impressed with it Arias I think probably had a bit less to do than than Cortez did um, but I mean, he still played well. But um, Cortes really did impress me because I wasn't I wasn't too optimistic either. I I, I agree with Alex. Huh? Um, he was good, in, uh, in, especially in the air balls uh, from the corners and on on the free kicks. He was especially um, uh, good on that on that space. And to add to that, uh, he shouted a lot. Uh, if you see the match again, you can see that he shouted a lot to his teammates. And that's something that we ask for a goalkeeper to have. I mean, uh, his leadership, uh, if he didn't have a leadership, well, he demonstrated yesterday and it, it was necessary. He, he was uh, ordering his teammates what to do, where to step in the field. And, and we could hear it, we, we, the ones we were watching the match. So that's an important point to add. And I'm very surprised too with his, with his match. I didn't expect it much because of the, of the matches he was playing for Colo Colo, not good at all. Um, but that uh, shows us that we have to make the analysis uh, after the matches and not before. I'm actually going to have to disagree a little bit here. Um, I think uh, both of the two goals that uh, Arias and, and Cortez allowed, I don't think they had a chance. Uh, I think they were they they, they did what uh, what people what you would expect from a goalkeeper to give you security, but I, at the same time uh, I think we definitely need to find uh, we we either have to hope that Bravos plays until he's forty, or uh, maybe look at uh, an, another option uh, in the back. I would have to say that I think that the goals that we conceded were mostly defensive errors rather than goalkeeping errors. Uh, yeah, I, I, mean, absolutely, that, I, yeah. I, I absolutely agree, but I want to add there that against Colombia, uh, Cortes had no hand-to-hand -hand, uh, duels, I don't know how to say it, uh, against the strikers because that was a good work from our defense, I think. Uh, he yeah. just had to, to take balls from the, from the corners and, and go, as I said before, he was good at the air balls. He, did, he had no one-on-one... Uh, -on -one, match uh, with another with another player so i think uh, well that's a good work from our defense but i have nothing nothing to say uh, about cortez uh, as i said i i expected less and and he he just did a good work uh, not especially a great match but a good match and that's uh, good for him and good for the team Dave, mm -hmm. we also got to consider um brian cortez is at a colo colo side that is very depleted in the back line. It's very exposed. Mm -hmm. And the results, obviously, if you check the table, Colo Colo is, is second last. Um, and it, if it's not for Cortes, the results will be worse. Um, he's pulling off two, three saves a match when he's on the pitch. So he's, he's, you know, 
alternating with Miguel Pinto, but um, he's got a lot of work when he's he's being called up. So, um, yeah, he's been very bold and he was definitely up for the task. Um, you know, VAR uh, went against us, then it went in favor of us. Um, against Uruguay, it went against us. Uh, you know, it's, it's you know it's it's interesting because I actually I, I was going for groceries and I was uh, it was the 89th minute and I was in the parking lot, you know, heading home and and you know you almost have a feeling, you know, that Uruguay, you know, historically they always score in the last minute. You look at the history of Uruguay. You can never be satisfied. Doesn't matter if you're up by one or two goals. Last minute, Uruguay in the history has always scored, uh, it, and not always, but in big matches. You know, um, I have to say, um, you 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 cannot uh, leave yourself exposed like that. I, I thought that VR. I think uh, they were very. Even though I just I don't understand the decision at all. Like I. You look at it again and again and again, and if he called the first one against uh, Sierra Alta, uh, and how how does he not uh, call the second one, uh, Matias? Uh, I, I, you can uh, unleash yourself. Oh, where to begin? Um, I think you know the only feasible explanation for not giving the Uruguay um, Chile the penalty in the final minute. In, in particular, as you said, after giving Euro a penalty in favour of Uruguay, a very, I mean, uh, that's a very debat debatable penalty anyway. But the only explanation is, I mean, they, they made a conscious effort not to give that penalty against Uruguay at home in, in, in the last minute. There's, I, I don't think there's any way four, what was it, four or five officials can have video replays of that footage and not, not think it's a penalty. It's just, it's just beyond me. Um, and I mean, I uh, would rather not get into Conor Bowles past antics, but I mean, if you look at the history of the level of officiating on, on, on the continent as a whole, um, and then you bring in VAR, which some of the best referees in the world have struggled with, as we saw at the World Cup, at the Women's World Cup, um, to put some of... <laughs> The, the worst referees, and in our case, the least experienced referee. I mean, that Paraguayan was officiating in his first uh, qualifiers that game. Mm. Um, you can't put somebody that inexperienced in charge and obviously adding the complications of VAR onto an already, um, let's say, poor low-level set of referees is, is never going to end well. And I mean, like we saw for the, the rest of the, the fixtures, it wasn't just the Chile game. Um, that sort of controversy. I mean, I think in the, the first game, Peru, uh, Paraguay, Zambrano should have been sent off for a clear punch from Almiron that wasn't given. And then obviously Brazil, Peru last night, um, uh, Richarlison's elbow not, not sent off. Um, and then again, in, in, in the final minute, that, that, that uh, penalty given and not, and not checked on Neymar. I mean, wh where is the foul there? Um, you know, it, it's funny. You had uh, in the Chile uh, Brazil game, uh, the referee was Chilean, uh, Julio yeah. Ascuñan. Uh, he is probably the most hated man right now in, in Lima. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> without a doubt. In, in all of police, Peru. police escort from, uh, had to get a police escort from the yeah. hotel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, saw that. What, um, Obviously, well. let's not try to get in too much into it, focus on the football side, but um, there has to be a handball, no, Nico? Oh, well, uh, as Matias <laughs> said, where, where to start from? I mean, uh, it was a robbery all over South America. I mean, uh, if, if you saw the matches, it wasn't just Chile at Montevideo. Even uh, Uruguay was robbed at, at uh, Ecuador. And the first goal they did, it, it was... Uh, they said it wasn't goal. Well, it was a goal. He wasn't offside. So uh, it was like a compensation. But, well, that compensation didn't, uh, that wasn't uh, good for us. So I, I don't care. I mean, uh, referees were too bad. Conmebol was too bad. I mean, um, lots of referees that its first uh, appearance in in FIFA matches, in, in qualifier matches. And, and, and you need to send the, the, the best from each country. I mean... That's what Chile did. Obviously, um, Bascuñan didn't have a, a, a good match. We all know it. He, people want to kill him in, in, in Lima. But uh, um, 
there, it wasn't a good uh, a good day. It wasn't a good date for 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 referees. I mean, um, their credibility, their 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 way to work, their their way to use the VAR. The, the VAR hasn't been a, a help for the sport. I mean, uh, we have just had bad moments along the VAR. So I don't know if they are using it to. Um, I mean to, to to do what they want to do to rob uh, to rob ourselves uh, or I don't know but um, I don't I don't like it I, I never liked that uh, uh, I would like it not to exist but it already it already exists but I I hope they they make it better because uh, as Matias said it, it is it, it's not possible to to understand it goes beyond ourselves that. That, that wasn't a penalty over there in Montevideo and a lot of more plays that were not there. The Peruvians were, the, the, they were stolen too. The, the Brazilians don't need that help to go to Qatar. So I think it, it's very bad and it's very, it's something to concern about. But, uh, well, if Conmebol is not going to do something, well, then FIFA will have to review it. So we'll see. Penalt, do you agree with Nico? Well, and, and, and also, absolutely, and also, let's not forget, and I'm sure everyone will agree, the first penalty for Uruguay um, against Chile, um, you know, the argument for referees, I, I spoke with two current FIFA um, refs during the week, um, you know, who watched the game, and they both they both defend the, the, um, the rule book. They say it wasn't a penalty. Um, with Sebastian Coates or quite this, um, because his arm was in a natural position, and I honestly I just find it a joke. Um, a hand to hand, you know, ball to hand, hand to ball, it hits a hand, it's a penalty. And and so I'd like to you know invite this question to everybody. What about the first penalty scored by Suarez, uh, which hits Sebastian Vegas? Was his hand in a natural position? Yes or no? I mean, if you're if you're diving in. For a slight tackle, where are you going to have your hands? Are you going to have them hidden in your pocket? Where, what this, you know, define intention and define the natural position of a hand. How do you define that? So, um, definitely shows that the refereeing is in inconsistent. If you're going to award that to, to Uruguay, be consistent and award it to Chile as well. And not to mention all the other matches um, already that, you know, we've, we've, um, briefly mentioned. I mean, with regards to that first penalty, I mean, I'm sure like like the rest of us, I was frantically looking up the, the IFAB rules for, for handball. Um, and if they say, as long as your arms are in a natural position and the ball comes off you and hits your own hand, so if it comes off your leg or your head onto your own hand, as long as your hands are in a natural position, it's not a penalty. And like you said, what is he meant to do with his arms when he's sliding in to get the ball? I mean, they're, they're as tucked into his chest as they, as they possibly can be. Um, so, I mean, like you said, and then if you are going to give that one and then claim that the chilly one in the second half is in a natural position, the, the Godin handball, I mean, it, that is inexplicable. inexplicable. Um, you know, we discussed earlier uh, the good performances of uh, individual players. Um, now let's just uh, let's talk about the guys that that didn't perform well. Um, I have to start by, uh, in my opinion, Eduardo Vargas. Uh, some people are saying he's an ex football player. Um, I think age is is definitely affecting him. You know, um, you know he he isn't uh, the player you know he he once used to be. Uh, in my opinion, he didn't perform. Um, in, in, the, in the two matches, maybe one he did better than the other, but uh, overall, uh, very, very, very concerning. Uh, we have to find uh, a, a new number nine. Um, Nico, I know you follow Universidad de Chile very closely, and I've reported uh, on them for years. Um, uh, do you see it the same way, or, or, or do you think uh, Eduardo Vargas has, has more left in the tank? Obviously, it's, it's normal at this age for, for players like him to, to start at the, to decline in, in level. Eduardo Vargas has turned himself in a player that cannot generate um, danger by himself. He has just turned into a player who is a scoring, a finisher. He needs to be, um, he needs to be alimentado. He needs to receive passes, a lots of passes, um, but he needs to receive the last pass 
and with a lot, lot, lots of spaces to, to, to make the goal. Uh, the Eduardo Vargas from Universidad de Chile, he, that was uh, all, almost uh, 10 years ago, uh, as I said before, it was a player who could uh, create his own opportunities to, to leave behind two rivals. And now that is something that he doesn't, uh, that he don't do. Um, Eduardo Vargas has turned into a lazy player. He, he doesn't like to help his teammates. He doesn't like to run. He doesn't like to create football. As I said, he wants to be as near as the area as possible to finish place, but uh, he's not the player he used to be. Um, and as I have always uh, said uh, in the national team, he does, uh, he has nothing to demonstrate to us because he has lots of goals. He's the second historic scorer behind Alexis. But uh, those things um, in some moment of your life starts to end and, and you have to find options. Uh, for me nowadays, Chile has no strikers to call. Uh, besides the uh, Felipe Mora, the only one who is playing and uh, scoring goals. But um, Eduardo Vargas' game is not what I like the most. Uh, and for a few years already, uh, I have been saying it uh, for those uh, along those years. So I don't know uh, what happens. I also think that if he's... Uh, if he's more uh, well-rounded by uh, better players, uh, he could improve. Uh, that's uh, that's something else too. But nowadays, Vargas has not the level to play uh, in the in the national team. But the the, the also the, the the other problem is that he has no no one be, uh, behind him. I mean, there's not not another one. Uh, yesterday, uh, Rueda had to look at the bench, and there was just Benegas, Meneses, Davila. None of them um, in a good uh, moment uh, at being the st a striker as we needed. Um, who else? Lorenzo Reyes. Uh, 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 we didn't have a bench. We didn't have options. Uh, so that's what that what what that's what made us lose for, uh, for for my vision. I mean, and and about Eduardo Vargas to finish. Um, well, he's gonna keep being called. I think uh, he's gonna keep coming to the to the team, and if he's good. Uh, well, well received, but if he's not, he has to go or to the bench or get out of the list. But that is not the Eduardo Vargas that we know. I mean, if Humberto Suazo keeps scoring goals to La Serena, give him the call up again. Yeah, yeah, well, he scored a golazo, yeah. huh? Yeah, <laughs> we're getting that desperate now. Yeah, I mean, why not? You know, it, it's, a, it's a very big problem. Uh, who <laughs> really replaces Eduardo Vargas uh, once he's gone? And right now, he's, he's not playing very well uh, for La Roja. Uh, Alex, who, who, who stands out to you who maybe should be given a chance? Uh, you look at that bench, uh, it wasn't very young, you know, uh, Landro Venegas, 31 years old from, from Palestina, you know, uh, some guys weren't called up, but it doesn't seem to be a, a generational change. Uh, how about Humberto Suazo? Uh, <laughs> Matias just uh, mentioned him, but yeah, yeah. no, it, it was a little dig. Um, but I don't, I, I really don't see any other um, options. I mean, yeah, we mentioned we were speaking earlier, you know, Humberto Suazo. Uh, I mean, he scored un golazo. I mean, it's you know, it looked like he was at his peak years again. Um, I mean, if he's the last option, you know, why not? Um, but I, I really I can't see anybody else kind of shifting into that role naturally especially um at the moment and perhaps you know maybe it is time to maybe look at younger players and and give a younger player that role already uh, maybe i mean hopefully if we do make it to qatar in 2022 he'll be kind of an evolved player already but at the moment um you know with la, la liga you know it, we don't really have any standout players i guess and and vargas like we mentioned earlier is getting a bit Lazy. I mean, I wouldn't blame it all on Vargas um, as a personal opinion. I think that I don't think we play to his strengths anymore. Um, obviously, he doesn't have the same strengths as he did at his peak. I mean, like Nico said, you know, he used to be able to create goals out of nothing. And that was absolutely amazing. But now he doesn't have that. And that's been for a few years. Um, you know, he I think at one point he was set to go to a big team and then he ended up in Mexico in and I think that just kind of killed his his kind of scoring um, hunger to a certain extent. Um, but I think for the most part in the striker role, I don't think we play to our strengths. If you know that Vargas can't create space for himself, you know that 
what's going to happen is that you're going to give him the ball and he's going to hold the ball up. So what happened, um, what I saw against Uruguay and Colombia is that he would get the ball and he would be all by himself and everyone kind of expecting them to do like a goddess work and just create a god of nothing. And we know that's not going to happen, but we still expected it. So then here we are criticizing him for not doing what we know that he can't do. Um, so I think, yeah, there's not many other options to replace him, but I also think that he's, I mean, he's still a, a great finisher. You know, he's, that's not going to go away no matter how lazy he is. Um, so I think that maybe, you know, start looking at younger players, but also start playing to our strengths and stop trying to be a team that maybe we're not. I mean, well, just to put it All on right, record, Matthias, Matthias. Um, Swasso is in the shape of his life. I mean, he's, he's in better shape now than he was uh, a few years ago. But regardless, on a serious note, I, I completely, completely agree with Alex. I don't think there is a replacement. I think Vargas is our striker still. Um, and I think a lot of the blame for his recent performances with the team falls on Rueda. If you look at the, if the managers that he's played under for the national team, whether he's been scoring goals or not at a club at club level, he's always performed when he's come to the national team. And like Alex said, the team has been brilliant around playing to his strengths. He's not going to create you a chance out of nothing, but he's brilliant in front of goal. He's brilliant at finding space and he's brilliant at playing, let's say, up alongside Alexis Sanchez. Um, and I think he has been one of several players that have either stagnated under Rueda or have actually regressed. Um, I mean, if you were to look at any of the golden generation, have, I mean, Alexis is Alexis when he plays for the national team, Vidal is Vidal, they're, they're always going to be at a high, high level. But I think he's, Rueda's got away from the things that even under, you know, PC was much maligned in, in, charge of, in charge of Chile, but even he got goals and he got the best out of Vargas. Um, and I think he's still the best striker we have. He's still the best finisher we have. And it's down to the manager to fit him into the team and to provide him with support. I would like to add there that it, it is not only the, the best finisher we have, it's the only finisher we have. <laughs> and that's the problem with Vargas. That's precisely our problem. There's no a player behind him saying, hey, here I am, I'm an option too. Uh, I think there is one, as we said with Daniel, and he is Felipe Mora. Felipe Mora is playing very well in the in the Portland. Uh, how, what is the name of the team? Timbers, Portland Timbers, Timbers in the MLS. In the Portland Timbers in the MLS. Since Rueda uh, called the players for the qualifiers, uh, he started to make goals, and he hasn't stopped. So. Uh, why not an option? He's younger than Vargas. He plays in a very similar football. MLS is not so different from the Liga Mexicana. Obviously, La Liga Mexicana is a little bit more competitive, I think, um, and, and has uh, a little bit more players. But it's not years away from, from, the, from the matches that Mora is playing. So uh, Vargas is not playing all the matches. He's not converting goals all the matches. Well, uh, not any striker does uh, if it is not Suarez or Messi, but or Lewandowski, but um, I think Mora is the man nowadays, uh, mm -hmm. maybe the only one, because uh, as, as, as I talked to my to my partners in the La Magia Azul, um, Angelo Enriquez is almost an ex-player, Nicolás Castillo injured, um, we have no strikers, we have no number nines, uh, we have good players uh, for forward positions, but um, in the wings, not in the middle, so I can I, I I look inside my mind and I can't find another name that is not Felipe Mora. I think that is the player. I don't say don't not not to call Vargas. Huh? Obviously we have to call him, but he needs to compete for for that place. He needs to compete for the striker position because he has no competition, and that's make him that that makes him feel comfortable with that. And there's no rush for him. So as long as he has the shirt, he's gonna use it. So when it's something who pushes from behind. I think to add to Nico um, on just Felipe Mora, um, the MLS is playing at the moment. Um, and they, they, I know the States have been a bit more stricter with um, their bubbles and in terms of quarantine. You obviously, if he went to national team duty, um, I'm not sure how it works in the States. Um, you can get exempt, but that might be down to the MLS. And if the club wants to release him um, to go to South America, because... Last time I checked, at least for a normal human being, it's two weeks quarantine there, two weeks quarantine here. 
So it just it might just be a matter of availability for Lucas Mora uh, for not being called up. Felipe, Felipe. Okay. Um, let's let's just do a quick count of strikers that we have. Castillo is out. Sagal, I think you know after what he unfortunately did in the Confederations Cup in Russia, missing that clear opportunity, people have crucified him. Um, Junior Fernandez, they've crucified him. Oh, Inia, he went. He went to the Emirates, so no. and he's gone to to the to the Middle East. Um, yeah. Binilla is is you know past his prime. Uh, we mentioned Castillo, Enriquez, you know hasn't performed. Paredes past his prime. Um, Suazo, we're mentioning Felipe Mora is probably the only viable option. Jean Meneses was another good option, um, you know, but yeah, not not of the of the caliber as we're all mentioning, you know, to 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 fill in that because a number nine needs to be. A poacher, he needs to be there at the right moment, at the right time, and and you know have that, which is what Falcao did to score our equaliser. He's there at the right moment, the right time. It doesn't matter if you hit it with the nose or with the arm, or well, doesn't matter if he hits the arm, but um, doesn't matter now with coming the ball refereeing. But you've got to be there at the, you know, you've got to be a poacher, and we need that. But as, we as don't have, more. I don't think we have the delivery for that though, because I think Vargas mm. can provide that. But if you yeah. look at if you look at all of our goals and all of our plays, you know, they gave Vargas the ball to feet, which as we said, isn't his strength. Um, there was barely any crosses into the box that you can poach anything out of. So like you say, like Falcao, I mean, he's, you can probably say he's a dinosaur at the moment, but yeah. here they are playing to his strengths. You know, if you give him the ball in front of the net, he's going to put it in the back of the net and that's the end of it. Um, but I think Vargas just, he's lacking that service that he's not getting at all and no one knows how to play with him. And I think that's, I mean, yeah, that's hurting us more than anything. Guys, I want to ask you, um, Reynaldo Rueda, a lot of people criticize him for only getting uh, uh, one point out of potential four, potential six, really, but but four uh, of what people thought uh, Chile deserved. Um, are you convinced that he is the coach to, to take La Roja uh, to Qatar 2022, or is there still some doubts? Not no, I have no doubts at least. Uh, then I will explain why. Yeah, just go, Matias. Oh, I'm. I have a lot of doubts. I'm. I'm very doubtful. I mean, I can't really see in the entire time he's been in charge. I can't really see what you could pinpoint as progression. I mean, he came in and 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 the, all this talk was about recambio, finding the young players, finding the new players. Went to Copa America last year, was it now? Um, yeah, last summer. And it was essentially the same lineup that, that finished the, the 2016, bar, bar a couple of players that weren't in the squad. And then you look at what's happened since then. I mean, it says a lot that for me personally, the, the, the match against Uruguay was probably one of the best games that Chile has, has played under Rueda. And for me, I thought, you know what? Maybe he's proving me wrong. Maybe he's proving people wrong. And, and this is a turning point. The start of the qualifiers is going to be a turning point. And then you look at the performance against Colombia in the next game, and it is just back to back to normal. I mean, there's nothing that you can look at in the game and in 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 the in the the, the play between the players that says right. I I can see what he's trying to do with this team. I can see what philosophy he's trying to implement onto this team. Um, and then on a on an individual level, are there players like I said earlier that have have progressed under him and improved under him? Um, I don't think there are any, and if anything, players like Vargas have regressed. But then again, you have to give him credit where it's due. He's called up the young back line and picked that young back line that performed well individually against uh, Uruguay um, in particular. Um, and of course, I mean, we've obviously praised him already on, on, on today's show, but Sierra Alta as well, the standout player for me. Um, an absolute gem, a find, and you have to give um, you have to give Rueda credit for picking him and putting him into the starting lineup. But I think just overall, there there isn't enough there that you can see in terms of improvement, in terms of tactics and, and strategies that that's, that gives me any confidence going forward that we're going to start picking up points. Um, Daniel, what um, do, do you think, Ronaldo Rueda? You know, with ten players uh, missing out on the squad. Um, with all the pressure that he had, you know, last year finishing fourth at, at the Copa America, um, are you are you a rodista or are you uh, a, a against uh, his philosophy, his his way of playing, and and ultimately uh, his results? 
I'm I'm with Matthias. Um, that yeah. Um, at World Cup qualification level, it's results. Um, you know, in terms of football, it's it's either the football side, the development, or the results. Um, and what counts here is is results. I think Rueda. I mean, you can't discredit Rueda. There's a reason why he took Ecuador and and Honduras to a, to a World Cup finals. Um, he knows his football. He's a he, he's good with his theory, but I don't think he's transferred it like Matias has said onto the Chilean team. I think um, there's also a key factor with Rueda um, with Chilean football, and I'm going to say this emphatically. And and it's something to do with our idiosyncrasy. A Chilean football manager, national team manager for Chile, needs to be disciplinarian. You almost got to be almost military type. You've got to you've got to draw the line in the sand. You've got to be tough. No, like Bielsa. Bielsa did that. Bielsa didn't care if you were Vidal or Alexis or or a superstar. If you didn't perform or if you didn't behave at camp, you're out. You're shown you're shown the door. And I think uh, Rueda is, is 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 a gentleman. I think he's too nice with everyone. I think he needs to still, um, you know, draw the line and sand and be tough. Um, and definitely, it was definitely shown um, in the second half last night against Colombia. He didn't make he, he didn't make the right, you know, substitutions at the right right time. And that's, you know, you, being a manager. I mean, you're not just a manager. You're working with a coaching staff. I've worked in professional coaching staffs. And as assistant or as a goalkeeper coach, and you've got two, three other coaches where you put, you, you, you know, you give your input, your decision, but at the end, the final decision is made by the head coach. And I think, you know, he's got a good staff, but I think he needs to make quicker decisions um, or, you know, more assertive decisions at the right moment of the game to be able to read the game better. Because <clears throat> uh, let's face it, international football is a crash course. You play at club football, you can score, you know, for fun. But there's only 90 minutes in international football. Um, and you've got to make the most of it. You're not going to impact. You're not going to make an impact to change a game in the, in the last five minutes. You need more time. Um, and and Rueda definitely should have made changes um, deeper into the second half. He left it too late. Uh, Nicolás, uh, the midfield, you know, very limited options, you know, uh, Rueda mentioned that he wanted guys that were playing. He didn't want to call up guys in Europe that, you know, were sitting in a bench. Um, he called up uh, Juan Pedro uh, Fuenzalia, Ch El Chapa, um, Claudio Baeza, also there, and, and Cesar Pinares uh, from, from the local tournament. Um, were you happy? Did, did they, from the, obviously, the level of the local tournament to play for the national team against national teams like Colombia, like Uruguay, did they live up to expectations? Uh, yeah, because the expectations were low. Um, we can't expect nothing from players. Uh, I have nothing against uh, Chapa and Pinares, but uh, they are coming from a Católica, uh, which played a very bad tournament on Copa Libertadores. So what we could we expect for a qualifying game? I, I didn't expect much from, from both. And even though Pinares make a good pass for Isla, that uh, was the uh, Alexis's goal. So I was happy uh, at last with that. But um, I would have preferred Pooch. I would have preferred, um, I don't know, another player. So well, we don't have too much too. So, um, and that's the point that I want to talk about. Uh, what was Daniel talking um, about Reda's process? I mean, he has done what he could. Um, uh, Yesterday he played for 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 the first time in the in the national stadium in the Estadio Nacional, and he has been the the, the manager for three years. So uh, it's not his his fault too. He has he has had many problems to to, to perform. He he couldn't uh, he he couldn't have uh, mat, mat, matches uh, because of the uh, of the social issues here in Chile and after the words uh, for the coronavirus. So uh, yeah, it has been an accidental. Um, uh, working time for Rueda and it's not his fault at all. I think uh, he has done a, a good job, a very good job with finding players. Uh, he used Angelo Sagal and all, all of those players in, in friendly matches and they are not here anymore. So uh, that's what we knew. We knew they didn't uh, have the level for this team and, and he left them out. So he's doing what, what is right for me. Uh, besides the non-calling of men or Diaz, that's another 
that, that's another page. Um, he, he called what he had he, he, and, and, and the injury as well. But Rueda has a deeper problem and, and the Chilean football has a deeper problem. As, as Daniel said, um, our, besides our idiosyncrasy problem that we need the discipline, well, uh, this is not fault of the trainer. It's a fault for me uh, of INFP and, and the clubs and the Chilean clubs. We can't ask Rueda to invent out of nowhere a left back, uh, a central midfielder, a striker. If clubs, Chilean football clubs don't do it. Here, uh, players don't play till they have uh, 21, 22 years because they find that they are too young or too green, as we said here, uh, not, not mature at all. So they they debutate late. Um, they have no comp competition uh, when they are young. So so that's fault of the clubs. Rueda has no options because the clubs haven't uh, haven't got uh, players out from their, their their divisions. So that's why I say uh, I stay with, the, with with this manager. He's one of the good managers in America. That there's no doubt about it. I mean, he took Honduras to the World Cup. He took Ecuador to a World Cup. He won a Libertadores Cup. He went to a Sudamericana final with Flamengo. I, I don't think uh, that was a gift from anyone. That's a that's a trainer. That's a manager who works. He has he has demonstrated with ten players less, and and he did did two good matches. Yeah, good and competitive matches against uh, direct rivals to go to the World Cup. And besides the the accidents, the the robbery and and, and well, the Falcao's goal at at, at the final, uh, it was a good performance of Chile with what we have. It was a good performance. That's that's what with I stay with. Um, you know, I I agree. I think uh, people are too hard on Reda. I think Reda needs uh, needs more credit than he actually deserves. And um, it's funny because Ricardo Gareca actually said uh, in a press conference uh, I was watching in Movistar. Um, These are just the first two matches. Yes, of course, uh, points matter, and uh, uh, a lot of points were were, were lost in this occasion. Um, but at the same time, it's 18 fixtures, 18 fixtures yeah. uh, to the World Cup. So at the end of the day, uh, this left. is what Chile has. This is what Chile has right now. Uh, um, left. And right now you have to think uh, national team uh, made up of 30 players. Uh, some national teams are, are have more depth than others. Uh, it, some national teams, besides the 20 players, you don't have anybody else. Some can expand to 30, 40. But at the end of the day, Chile has what they have, and, and that's it. Uh, you know, Chile, Chile I, next month playing um, against uh, two very, very good uh, teams. Um, Matias, how, how do you think uh, Chile will do? You know, they have to bounce back against uh, a very good Peruvian side and, and a, Ven a Venezuelan side that sometimes is, is, is taken un uh, underrated. Mm. I mean, um, I, I completely agree with what Nicolas said about the state of the NFP and about the, the domestic league and the club's inability to produce players and get them playing at a high level. But if, but if you take, for example, the two positions you mentioned in midfield and left back that Chilean clubs aren't able to produce. That was Chile just has, an example, yeah. No, I know, I know. But just, just as an example, we have Marcelo Diaz, we have Eugenio Mena that are ready to come in and they are flaws of Rueda that he has those players at his disposal. And for some reason, I mean, I'm not sure anyone on here could explain the reason for omitting either of those players. I mean, in particular, Marcelo Diaz, who has never played, I think, under him. Um, so, I mean, going forward, I completely, you know, I'm, I'm, I might sound like I'm very anti Reda, and, and I, I probably am, but I, I, can see, <laughs> <laughs> I can see the other side. I can see the other side of the picture. I know he had a lot of players missing, but then we say, you know, it's just the first two qualifiers, but, and there's a long way to go, but have we honestly, have any of us seen enough in the time, in his time in charge to say that we can be convinced that he is building something, that there is a process behind what is happening on the pitch. I, I haven't been able to see it. And I kind of similar to what, to what, to what Daniel said, um, it is either results or performances. And I could almost forgive the results in this situation i could forgive coming out of these first two games with only a point if i could see that there was some sort of process there was some sort of game plan behind what was happening on the pitch but i don't see that either 
You know, Chile got very uh, comfortable against the Colombia uh, in the last uh, 10 minutes. I think that's that's what really led to to mm. the, the tying goal, no? Um, I mean, they were back- defensive that last 45 minutes, I think. Yeah, yeah and, and Vargas' the substitution wasn't the, 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 the correct one for me, at least. Uh, mm. It wasn't Nicolas Diaz who had to go into the, the field. I mean, we had no options up front anyway, and you take off the striker and put on another defender. I mean, it doesn't really make sense. It's only going to make yeah. us more defensive. What, what happened there is that Carlos Queiroz, uh, he put another striker, I mean, another forward player, and that's why uh, our de- defensive line went and hand on hand. I mean, they were uh, four versus four, so they had no spaces to to have one player uh, free to give the, that help in the midfield. That player was supposed to, uh, to be uh, Baeza, but well, it was um, the last 20 minutes, he was tired. And that's why I say the, the correct substitution was or Lorenzo Reyes uh, to press in the midfield, or Uh, I can't believe I'm gonna say this. Or Benegas to go up there and and press a little bit uh, to the to the defender side. I I swear I I didn't um, I didn't thought uh, in my whole life that I was going to ask shouting at TV. Please Benegas, please. And it didn't happen. But well, that talks about uh, a lot about uh, the options that we have. We have no bench. That's our. That's one of our great. Uh, Doubt, 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 that's doubt. Uh, I don't know how to say it. Um, let's, let's uh, before we wrap this uh, this show up, let's uh, let's uh, preview uh, the next two matches uh, in the November window against uh, Peru and, and Venezuela. Uh, Daniel, what, what are you expecting out of that or out of those two matches? Uh, you're mute, you're mute. Okay, now I'm back. Um, Peru and Chile don't need any introduction. Um, the, the, the fierce animosity between the two countries, unfortunately, uh, uh, transferred onto the football pitch. Um, we're going to face a, a Peru side, um, which, as we speak, they, they, they want to hang. They want to crucify Julio Acuñan. Um, the referee has nothing to do with the 11 on the pitch. But um, Peru is very competitive. Um, Carrillo is immense. Uh, Cueva, very technical, um, etc. A brilliant goalkeeper. Uh, Ad, Advincula, very fast. Advincula is a machine, he's a, he's a, he's a lightning fast. Um, and so, do you need any more motivation? I mean, if you're, if, you're, if you're in the dressing room and if you're chilling, you're up against Peru or vice versa, you don't need more motivation itself than the fact that you're playing against your, your neighbor. So, um, it's do or die. We need to stamp our authority um, at home. And, um, you know, it goes back to everything that we've touched on. Um, we, need a, we need a finisher. But um, I think Peru, well, without Zambrano, I think, um, look, if we repeat the mistakes, I think Peru are going to crucify us early in the match. If we manage to control, especially... Uh, the midfield, um, and and yeah, score. Look, we need to do whatever it takes by any means. Um, even if we if we play ugly, but we score and we win and we get over the line, it's it's three points. And then away to Venezuela, we need to be careful. It's it's a cultural thing um, across South America. We tend to to look down upon Venezuela. You know, they're they're a baseball nation. They're not football, but they've grown. Um, in stature over the years, it's obviously, you know, statistics say they're the only country that haven't uh, qualified, but uh, you can't underestimate Venezuela. Um, yes, they were exposed against Colombia at home, uh, sorry, away in, in Barranquilla, but um, at home, they can trouble you. They can trouble you in, in dead ball situations. Um, so let's not get, you know, uh, confident and uh, and I'm um, arrogant about that, you know, playing away in Venezuela is no easy feat. There's climatic and, and weather conditions as well. Um, we need goals. We need goals. Either we, again, we play pretty, we play ugly. We need to, we need to put the ball in the back of the net. Absolutely agree. Um, what, what do you, how do you see it, uh, Alex? You know, 
uh, Peru being our, our rivals and, and Venezuela, who, who has players uh, in Europe and and has uh, in the past gone uh, very surprising results in in this in this very competitive region. Yeah, I definitely have to agree with uh, Daniel. Uh, you know, Chile Peru. I mean, we've that's just a classic game. You know, and Conmebol, it's it's something that we look forward to, and you know, it's never it's never been an easy match. Um, even if Peru weren't at their greatest, you know, it, it was a match that they showed up for. And that's, I think now at the moment, given the, the status of our national team, um, I think it's about how Reda is going to manage the players that he has, um, whoever be available for that game, you know, like um, Daniel mentioned, you know, your Chilean player going into a match against Peru, you know, you're going to show up that day, no matter what, that's your motivation. You don't need something else. But I think now it's about how Rueda is going to manage that match, whether it be tactical, whether it be intelligence. You know, you don't have to play the prettiest football, but be smart about your play. Don't give Peru, uh, you know, their strengths. Um, I think it's just a matter of how the players are going to show up. You know, are we going to be hot headed that day, which, you know, can easily happen in the Chilean national team? Or are we going to be smart and just play our football and go out for the win? Uh, and however that may be. Um, so I think it's just a matter of Rueda and how the players show up more than the actual football and, and anything else of it. Um, I mean, obviously, I think Chile Peru is always going to be up for grabs for whatever team, um, no matter what state, no matter how good the players are, you know, no matter the bench. Um, we can go in with one person on the bench, but we can still get points from Peru. So I, I can't really do a prediction that well. It's just a matter of who shows up on the day. And for Venezuela, I think it's quite similar. Uh, it is true that we tend to kind of put Venezuela as the, the automatic underdogs in, when it comes to football. Um, but they have showed it in previous games that they can play football no matter what, even if statistically, you know, they haven't gone to World Cups or they just, they've never been on top. But it's not an easy match. Um, but I do think just because of our level and I think just because of these two past matches that, I know we've underperformed and we haven't gotten the points that we've needed to. Maybe I think that's just a little push on the players that they need. Um, so I think with Venezuela, I think I have maybe I shouldn't be too optimistic, but I do think that we can get away with three points in that game. Uh, Nicolas, and then finish uh, off with uh, Matias uh, to, to wrap up uh, since we are uh, short on time. It's an obligation to win the six points. There is no doubt about that. The players know it. We know it. Rueda knows it. Um, and there are weapons for that. We already saw. We have options uh, to, to make a good team. I hope, I ask please to the universe not to, not, not to get injured to, to any of our players. I mean, that was the, for me, uh, the biggest reason of why we didn't perform better than we did that for me was correct and good. So uh, it depends on that. Uh, I repeat it. Chile is a short team. We have not many options, not even in the bench when we have them, but including these 10 players that uh, were missing out of these matches. Um, well, I think it, it can be another history. It can be another, another kind of matches and we're going to need them. Um, Talking about uh, how to play to to get those matches. I, I mean, well, um, a classical. We already said it. Um, guys said, already said um, against our neighbor Peru. Uh, in a long history, Chile uh, has win these two matches lots of times. Um, that's why I say it's an obligation uh, for the points uh, for history and because uh, historically talking, we are a better team and and at least in the papers, at least in the numbers. So that's what we ask for to get that. Uh, I don't know how you call them in English. That mystica, that mystic uh, from from inside and and make it happen. We have to we have to play those matches with something else that that football and and we know it. Matthias, uh, finish us off. Yeah, I mean, um, I completely agree with what uh, Nicolas said. I mean, you look at I say let, let's say for the last decade the last three qualifying um world cup qualifying rounds chile you would look at fixtures against peru and venezuela and it wouldn't be guaranteed but you'd feel very confident of getting six points from those six points from those games but the same thing happened to me last 
tonight. I was looking at the upcoming fixtures after having just got a point from these first two games. I was like, okay, that you know, that's six points against Peru and Venezuela. I kind of had to shake myself out of that and kind of think Chile are very much on the down uh, and Peru and Venezuela, two teams very much on the rise at the moment. And there's no guarantees that we're going to get six points from, the, from those two games. There's no guarantees we're, we're going to get even four points from those two games. Um, so I think Chile have been one of the best teams in South America for the last for the last decade, and they are no longer up there. And they, as as I as I had to last night, Chilean players also need to adapt to that mentality that they are no longer the best team, or one of the best teams in South America. Um, but against Peru, I mean, I think it's, it's an old cliche, but but team form um, does go out of the window in one of those in one of those classicos. Um, but I mean, the last two games we played against them, that humiliation in the Copa America, uh, coupled with the humiliation in, in, in the friendly in the States, um, doesn't fill me with confidence. But you would hope, you would hope that Rueda had learned his lessons from those two games, because I think, you know what, if it's three points or less from these two games, I mean, you could make an argument that, that he probably shouldn't continue. Yeah, no doubt about it. That's why I said an obligation. Yeah. It's a must win. It's a must win for Chile. And um, we will all be watching for sure. Uh, thank you everyone for, for watching and listening to the show. Uh, episode two on YouTube. Um, I want to, uh, from, from myself and for the rest of my team, uh, uh, thanks again and uh, join us next time.